Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine radio show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan, and so glad to have you along with us on a day as I'm sitting here in the studio that feels more like wintertime than it does springtime. But we knew when it was 70 degrees in February that we were going to have to pay for it sooner or later, and sooner or later... The weather is going to break. Oh, by the way, welcome to the month of April. April showers, you know what they bring, right? Well, April snowstorms, apparently. But it's not going to last forever. And if you look at the long-term forecast, it's going to get warmer. To the point where I'm thinking, as soon as the weather breaks, I'm going to call into the folks at the Linwood Beach saying, get the Angler Quest out of storage. It's time to go. But I don't need it for the next few days. Even though I'm not going to be fishing for the next few days, I did get my new fishing license cost me all of $11 for an all-species fishing license because I'm a senior now. I got the senior discount. Don't want the senior discount, but I got the senior discount. Even if I didn't get the discount, it's still only $26. $26 to fish for all species 365 days a year. Yet people still gripe about the cost. How can you? How can you I'm not going to, I'm not going to hunt or fish anymore because it costs too much. If, if you seriously quit hunting or fishing because of the cost of the Michigan license, then you weren't that committed to the lifestyle, to the sport, to the activity in the first place. I always use this uh, example, but last week it hit me right in the face. Last week, I took three of my grandkids to the movies. Now, they're all getting older. They go to the movie just, I think, to, to placate grandpa and because they get Popcorn in a, in, a, in a dinner out of it afterwards. <laughs> I don't remember what it cost me, but, well, yeah, I tell you, one, one big bob, uh, jumbo thing of popcorn was like 11 bucks, which is the cost of my senior fishing license. I think it's a great value. Anyway, my goose saga continues. I told you last week that I got a coyote decoy to put up on the edge of the yard. Now, I love the geese on the pond behind the house, but that's where I want them, on the pond behind the house. I don't like them coming up into the yard. They're just, they're just big rats, just very, very messy animals. In the past, what I've done is put up a goose barricade, a goose fence, a three-foot-high green snow fence. It blends in. It is, it's not offensive, and it works. It keeps the geese out of the yard, but it's a hassle to put it up. So my wife, Denise, said, hey, I saw online, this woman said she had a, de- goose, uh, a, a coyote decoy, and it keeps the geese out of the yard. I thought, I don't think it's going to work. But I'll try it, because it's a lot easier than putting up a goose barricade. And so far, it's kind of working. We did have two birds sneak up into the yard, but the most of them are staying out. So we'll see. I don't think it'll work long term, but for now, <laughs> I'm going to give it a try. I uh, made a trip to Jay's last week, or this week since we've talked. I went up there with the intent of getting a case of ammo for my grandson Carter to shoot with his high school trap shooting team because their season has started now. I think I can't say enough about the high school traps teams Um, to get kids involved in the shooting sports, to teach them to use guns safely. uh, I'm I'm absolutely all in favor of it. So we went to Jay's. I went to the Claire store and I did pick up that case of ammo. But while I was there, you know how it is when you go to Jay's, I also picked up a new pellet gun. I picked up a handful of the precision walleye crankbaits, the uh, uh, Fishing 411 baits. And while I was there, I thought, well, i got to grab a bag of the Mike Avery Hunter Sticks from Michigan brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked up my suppressor 
for my 350 Legend, and I still had to fill out more paperwork to get the suppressor. They don't make it easy, but it's getting easier. It took me only three weeks from the time I applied to get the approval. Talking with the folks at Jay's, this new system in place now, they had one approval come back in two hours. Most of them, a couple of weeks. If you applied after the first of the year using the new system. If you applied in 2023, the fall of 2023 or the winter of 2023, you're still in the old system and it's going to take months. They also said that if you have an application in from 2023 and you now make an application for a new suppressor in 24, your 24 application is going to be on the same time frame as the 23. So it's going to take you months. So it turns out I was smart but didn't even know it by waiting to uh, make my application for the suppressor now. Um, I haven't used the suppressor yet because I need to get a new scope on that Brenton. I want to get a 3 by 9 by 40 um, In fact, I looked at I, I was looking at a, at a couple of them at Jays. I looked at a Vortex. I looked at a Leupold. I had them both in my hands. Then I looked at my cart and said, eh, let's wait on the scope. They did laugh at me, though, when I walked up to the counter with that Wraith 270 see-through ground blind and said, I'd like to use the promo code Avery424. And they said, aren't you Mike Avery? <laughs> I said, yes, but I want to use the promo code. And I got it for 149 bucks. $149.99 to be exact. You can get one, too. I've got three promo codes going on right now. That, 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 uh, the promo from Jay's, where you can get that Wraith during the month of April. If you go into their Claire store or their Gaylord store, pick one up, walk up to the counter and say, I want to use the Avery 424 car, uh, promo, and you'll get one for 149 bucks. If you can't get to the stores, if you go online at jsportinggoods.com, jsportinggoods.com, you can use the same promo code, Avery424, and you can get one for $149.99. Rapid River. Use the promo code Avery10 to get 10% off. More on Rapid River here in just a minute. And Michigan Brand. Go to the website, michiganbrand.net. Use the promo code Mike20. Get 20% off your entire order. See, I'm saving you money. I'm saving you money all over the place. Now, yeah, you're going to have to spend a couple of bucks to save some bucks, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, what else is going on? I've been doing some half-hearted turkey scouting, um, mainly just on my number one property, a uh, property where I see birds and have close encounters with birds every year. But something's changed there. My buddy Doug, who owns the property, was working with the farmer next door. And the farmer says, hey, Doug, I want to take down that tree line on the, on, the, on the property edge between us. There was a tree line there that made it harder for the uh, farmer. I think that's why he did it. made it harder for the farmer to get in there and maneuver his equipment. And Doug says, yeah, take it down. I don't care. But it has really changed the feel and the look of that property. And I'm not seeing, and again, I haven't been sitting out there yet, but just keeping an eye on it, I'm not seeing the birds out there and the birds move through there like they used to. So I think that might affect my setup for this spring. In the past, I would take that Wraith 270, set it back up in the corner there of Doug's farm, back in that corner along the tree line, and just sit there and wait, and the birds would come by there. Like I said, I did see some tracks, and they were big tracks. I'm sure they were, uh, you know, gobbler tracks, tom tracks, but I, I don't know. Coming up on this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show, and it's a, it's a, it's a work in progress, even as we're talking right now. Adam Lewis, uh, an outdoor writer, uh, is my first guest this week. He talks about the state of deer hunting today. Now, you might say, why are we talking about deer hunting in April? And that's a great question. The reason Adam wanted to bring it up, and I think this is valid, is because the deer management initiative process is getting ready to kick off. In fact, it's already pretty much started. DMI, Deer Management Initiative. Adam wants to get some points out there so when the DMI people meet, they're thinking along 
uh, thinking along the line that Adam is. And that is things need to change. Now, Adam will reference here, coming up after the break, he'll reference a letter from Chad Stewart. Chad is the uh, DNR wildlife biologist, um, talking about a letter he sent out a few months ago about looking for input. That's what the DMI does. Anyway, that's why we're talking about deer management right now. Then um, <clears throat> outdoor realtor Matt Smith with some advice on buying recreational properties, your place up north, maybe a, a getaway. <clears throat> is this a good time to do it or should you wait? Well, I say don't ever wait. If you can do it, do it now. Here's where the rub comes up. In the second hour, I had Chris Durson of Rapid River Knives scheduled for the show. I've had Chris scheduled for the show for the last two weeks. I talked to Chris yesterday. <clears throat> he said, we're good to go. I'm looking forward to the conversation. This morning, I walk into the studio. I get a text from Chris saying, hey, we just had a great big winter storm. Power is out at the shop. The phone lines are out at the shop. We're going to have to use my cell phone. Well, we've tried to use Chris's cell phone before, and it doesn't work. So I'm still tap dancing. We'll see what happens there. In the second part of the second hour, Amy Trotter of MUCC joins me to talk about the lawsuit they just filed against the NRC. Kudos to them and to the Michigan Trappers and Predator Callers Association for doing the same thing. And in our third hour, we're talking springtime fishing with Mark Martin. And, of course, we wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner. So it's a, it's a work in progress. If you want to see who ends up in the second hour, you're going to have to stick around till the second hour because right now I can't tell you. My name is Mike Avery. This show is called Outdoor Magazine. My website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address, Mike, at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on more than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan, including WZTK in Alpena. That's 105.7 FM. You can hear us in Muskegon on WKBZ. That's 1090 AM and north of the bridge in Newberry. WNBY 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination, and it's getting to be that time when you're going to want to get your boat out there on Saginaw Bay. The fishing has been good when Mother Nature lets you get out there, but the weather's going to turn, and you're going to, be want, to, you're going to want to be out there on Saginaw Bay, and Linwood Beach is a great place to hit the water. You can learn more online at linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. Linwood Beach will be the... Um, the uh, site of our Walleye for Warriors event and also the Angler Quest owners tourney. So keep an ear out for that. All right, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit about deer hunting. Look at, I know it's not the deer hunting season, right? Uh, we're thinking about turkey season, but here in our state of Michigan, uh, it seems like we're never real far from deer hunting. Now, Adam Lewis, is a, a hunter. He's an outdoor writer, a media producer. He's the founder of Deer Hunter IQ. It's a podcast and a blog. And he reached out to me um, about a week ago. And he says, Mike, I, um, I watched your clip on the coyote regulation by NRC. He said, I'd like to talk to you about that. He said, there are a lot of things going on now in the world of uh, whitetail hunting. And Adam will bring you on the line here. Not all of it, um, in your opinion, is good, is it? Yeah, well, thanks for having me uh, on, Mike. But, yeah, there's a lot going on right now in deer hunting uh, around the nation, really, with some different trends, you know, with uh, really hunter numbers on the decline. And in Michigan, I think we're kind of at a tipping point. Um, I wrote a recent article for Woods and Water News about that, just uh, some ideas in there. But really, uh, and right now, in Michigan, they're, the DNR and NRC are gearing up for those uh, deer management initiative meetings because they realize, you know, things aren't going real well, and we need to we need to make some changes uh, in in the deer hunting world with uh, how we treat things, I believe, and just with regulations as well. Um, and I think that really came to a forefront with the admission of it. I, I, for a lot of years, you know, Michigan hunters haven't been real happy with the deer herd and how it's managed. Um, 
I think this past year, it seems like for the first time, the DNR has kind of admitted that and really seem like they're willing to to be more open with what they're doing about it. Um, and I think we saw that with that open letter from Chad Stewart about, you know, uh, the doe population and us, at least in the uh, lower Penis- peninsula, needing to take more does. I think that was the kind of the start of it. There was this. Uh, also, around the same time, this publication by uh, the National Deer Association that basically said, hey, these states are failing in these areas, and Michigan was one of them uh, with the doe harvest. And so there's some things that are really out of whack, and uh, I think we're kind of at a tipping point in regards to some of the stuff. Are you then overall happy with the DNR, the NRC, the way things are being run? Um, I'd say a lot of people aren't, I I would say that it's been mismanaged for quite a while. Um, and I mean, if you want to put blame in different places, the the hunters are to blame for some of this, where we are now with the Michigan deer herd. And so is the DNR, uh, and the NRC, uh, there's blame to be passed around. I think we're definitely at a point that hopefully we can fix some of these things. I think we need to do that. But I think, you know, if somebody digs into, and I would really, I guess, implore and encourage anybody on that DMI uh, group and that team, and just hunters in general, to read Michigan's actual management plan. You can go online and do that. It's like 35, 36 pages, but it really outlines the goals of the DNR, uh, how they approach things, how they view hunters. And when you look at that, I, I think it will, will really be eye-opening to a lot of hunters uh, to realize a few things. And first is that uh, the hunters are a tool of the DNR. That's how they look at hunters, right? Uh, they're the biggest tool to help manage the herd, but they're just a tool. Um, and also, when you look at that, I realized, and you know, I've been – learning about this as well as a hunter and you realize that their goals don't seem like they're they're good goals right they they are not measurable things and when you think about goals they should really be things that are measurable right and so i really think at the base level if we want to make some good changes in the deer herd uh and deer hunting we've got to start back there with having actual good measurable goals that are based on herd health. And, you know, recently I talked to uh, the NDA, uh, Kip Adams over there, who's their head biologist and really, you know, what does a healthy deer herd even look like? And he basically said, and I'm, you know, just quoting him an expert it's a buck doe ratio that's as close to one as one as possible. And that's hard to totally get, but, as close to that as possible. It's a relatively balanced age class herd as well. And it involves having a habitat that can adequately handle the deer population. If you look at our goals, only one of those is addressed in our current goals. So something's way out of whack there. And on top of that, we don't have ways to measure them. And so getting back to the basics of, okay, setting good goals based on a healthy deer herd, And then, you know, ones we can actually measure, I think, are super important, and we don't have those currently. Um, So I think that's a place where we have to start is, and then regulation should back those up, right? And right now, regulations, I feel, are really all over the place. Uh, And when you don't have goals to start with that are measurable, it's really hard to know where you're going and what you're doing. Well, you mentioned DMI, the Deer Management Initiative. A lot of people have some high hopes for that, uh, Adam, that maybe maybe that group can come together and address some of these things you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a hope, right? You would hope that. Uh, Some people are very, I guess, pessimistic about it as well because they have public meetings from time to time. And if you read that, management plan they it's part of their plan is to have these every now and again so it's not out of the ordinary but i think we kind of are at a tipping point as far as the dnr uh seems like they're more willing to take input 
right? Uh, they're more willing to and open to ideas. So that's probably uh, a good thing. And I guess we'll see uh, what the DMI, DMI produces because they don't have to listen to those groups and whatever they wind up suggesting. You mentioned tipping point a couple of times. Tipping point, Adam, as to how we maintain hunter numbers, how we maintain a healthy deer herd, how we keep our interest in deer hunting. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think all those things. Um, but there's also this idea of, you know, the DNR managing it. If you, again, you go back to that management plan, it would really, I think, it's a good education for a lot of hunters that don't really realize what the DNR's goals are. And uh, the reality is, I think a lot of hunters think the DNR manages the herd for the hunters, and they don't. They, they manage it for the people of the state. And so as hunter numbers decline, which they have a lot, uh, the DNR is faced with something, which is how do we manage the herd with declining hunter numbers? And the whole issue of, you know, the, the doe buck ratio, all that stuff and, and Chad's letter, but how do they do that when their, their number one tool is not getting the job done? And so, that's, I think, a tipping point, right? Because the DNR, and this is my perspective on this, but the DNR, and it says it right in that plan from 2016, which is the latest updated one to my knowledge, it says um, that they realized even back then that the hunters aren't getting the job done. It basically, may, it says, may no longer be adequate to manage the deer herd. And so when it gets to that point, the DNR already knows that, what are they going to do? They're going to have to implement other strategies. And so I think that's the tipping point. Like, I think hunters have to realize that, that, hey, we need to do a better job managing ourselves as well uh, with these things. And again, on the DNR side, as far as making good regulations to actually do that to actually reach those outcomes. Well, the North American model calls for hunters to control wildlife populations. What other options are there? I don't know. Uh, I think it is interesting, though. You, you talked about, you know, the, the latest NRC thing with the, the coyotes, yeah. right? Do you, do you know the re – did they come out with a reason for that? <laughs> it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> okay. Um, that is one potential – thing I could see. Like my interpretation would be, okay, a natural predator of white tail or coyote. So they have to manage it in some way. So if the deer hunters aren't getting it done, uh, natural predators can help, right? Is that a reason they did it? I don't know. But it you can kind of maybe put two and two together there. Well that's interesting. Um I hadn't actually thought of that, but that's interesting. I was looking at it from some, from some different perspectives. If our NRC is that has that much foresight, um, that'll actually be a pleasant surprise to me. I got to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. If that's the solution we want. Um, but again, back in 2016, they were saying that, like they already knew that. Hmm. We're talking with uh, Adam Lewis. Uh, Adam is an outdoor writer. He's a hunter. You can find him, more about him online at DeerIQ.com. DeerIQ.com is his website. From there, you can get to his social media outlets, his blogs, and his uh, different posts and such. He uh, recently had an article in Woods and Water News uh, talking about time for a change, and that's how this whole conversation between Adam and I this week came about. Um We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. But when we come back, I want to talk with more more with Adam about this. Uh, where does he deer hunt, see deer hunting in Michigan go? What can we as deer hunters do to help out or to get out of the way, depending on how you look at it? Again, uh, Adam Lewis, uh, DeerIQ.com, DeerIQ.com. We'll take a break. More coming up right here on Outdoor Magazine.
Welcome back to uh, Outdoor Magazine. Appreciate you being along with us this week. You know you can hear the show on more than 30 stations across the great state of Michigan, including WBCK in Battle Creek. That's 95.3 FM. You can hear us in uh, Sandusky in the Thumb, WMIC, 660 AM, 95.3 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux, WKNW, 1400 AM. This segment of uh, Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by a Premier Maritime Training. If you've ever wanted to get your captain's license, I think this is your best bet. Captain John Littlefield taught my captain's class, and he can help you become a licensed charter captain as well. Check out the website, pmtcaptains.com. For more info, that's pmtcaptains.com. John has classes across the state, and I'm sure you can find one that fits your schedule. That's pmtcaptains.com. Dot com. Right now, though, we're talking about deer hunting. We're talking about the status of deer hunting, the future of deer hunting, where we are today with Adam Lewis. Adam is an outdoor writer. He's a content creator. Uh, you can learn more on his website, DeerIQ.com. That's DeerIQ.com. Adam, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're involved in. Um, what's the purpose of the website and the other activities you're involved in? Uh, well, as a writer, you know, I've been doing that for over 10 years and uh, I'm just a passionate hunter, but really is to educate hunters to be, you know, better deer hunters and also just talk about some of these important topics, I think, um, that maybe we've avoided for years and years. So those two things, you know, how to be a better hunter and talk about stuff like this uh, that are important when you look at our legacy um as stewards and as you know deer hunters a couple of things you mentioned uh regulations um give me an example what are we talking about you mean like baiting or, or uh, aprs or, or what are you talking about yeah all, i mean all that stuff so as i said once i think we if we can get some good goals that we can actually measure and show progress toward one thing before I jump into that is that I think that'll help the DNR with one of their major issues, which is hunter trust, which they their by their data um, in that report is 46% of hunters do not trust the DNR. So it's really hard to get anywhere and get people on board with something when people just do not trust you. And I think if you can get goals and measure progress toward those goals and show hunters that you're actually doing that, I think that will really help with their, the trust issue. Right. Um, once you do that, I think, yeah, regulations have to back up these herd goals, you know, once you get those in place and just going back to like Chad Stewart's letter, you know, talks about we need to take more does in the, you know, lower peninsula. We are too buck centric, meaning we're so focused on shooting bucks, Right. And so if those are a problem, some of our current regulations, I really think, do not back those up. They do not help us achieve those things. Like if we're two buck centric, we want to take more does. Why do we have a two buck limit? Right. Why do we have two buck tags? To me, those do not make sense together. Right. Especially, that's, a, that's a great question, too. And especially since our gun season starts in the middle of the rut. Right. And so. If we want to turn those things around, I think those those are things we need to change. I don't know about APRs. There's mix, mixed feelings on that. I personally think one buck tag would help with that uh, because it allows hunters to choose. Like if you want to shoot a spike, you can shoot a spike, right? But it makes hunters psychologically really think about it, right? Like this is my one buck. Um, do I really want to take this deer or not? And it, it will cause people to pass more bucks and at the same time also help with age structure issue we seem to have in michigan right getting a better class of buck and deer in general because people are passing more with one buck tag and it also i think just as one you know this is one example but just as one would also force people to start taking does if they would need more than one deer in the freezer right so it I think start solving that doe issue too. When you just issue one buck tag, well, if I, I need more deer in the freezer, I'm going to have to go shoot more yeah. does. 
Right. I, I, I don't know if we will ever get deer hunting in Michigan back to what it was when I was a kid growing up. But if we don't get a handle on this and get this pointed in the right direction, I think the future of deer hunting uh, certainly doesn't look like it used to. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. And, you know, to the whole buck centric thing as well, if you want to talk, you know, regulations, if you look at the, the youth season. Right. There's a lot of arguments around that and i think um, emotional responses around that for some reason because talking about kids i get that but when you really look at it and you look at the data from our last two years we've actually counted we've actually reported you know harvest there are 3.6 bucks taken for every one doe during youth season that's a very lopsided very buck centric trend and so when we allow that in that early use season for all these bucks to be shot. I know it's not a huge number compared to the total harvest throughout the whole year, but when you allow that, you're continuing to educate and continuing this buck centric mentality, right? You are further furthering that along instead of just saying, you know what? We can tell our kids no as adults, as mentors, and as, you know, the DNR who sets regulations and say, Hey, you're going to learn about hunting, but you're only going to be able to shoot does. It's going to help us with our our mentality and the education part, which the education part. Adam, is listen, you bring part. you bring up you bring up some wonderful points. I appreciate your time. The timing is great with the DMIs coming up. Adam Lewis, DeerIQ.com. That's DeerIQ.com. More coming up after the break. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Cairo on WKYO 1360 AM and WIDL 92.1 FM. You can hear us in St. Joe on WSJM 94.9 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in uh, Marquette, WDMJ 1320 AM. Speaking of north of the bridge, this segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the company that makes this sound. That's the sound of my Rapid River Knife opening, and it does look like we will be able to talk with Chris Durson of Rapid River uh, after the top of the hour. Rapid River Knife Works, um, if you can, I would strongly encourage you to go to their showroom on US2 just east of Rapid River. It's a beautiful, beautiful facility. If you can't make it there, go to the website, rapidriverknifeworks.us. Use the promo code AVERY10, that's AVERY10, to save 10% on your order. Handmade knives by craftsmen in Michigan's Upper Peninsula with a lifetime guarantee. This is something you're going to pass down to uh, future generations. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us. Want to uh, turn our attention now to a good friend of mine, Matt Smith. I've known Smitty for a long, long time, and he's worn a lot of hats over the years, and he's done them all very, very well. These days, I think of Matt as a guy who helps families achieve their goals reach their dreams. Matt is a realtor, and he uh, concentrates on recreational properties, vacation homes, although he sells his fair share of primary residences as well. Hey, Smitty, welcome back to the show. How are you? Good, Mike. How are you doing? Uh, doing real good. Always a pleasure to talk with you, my friend. I want to. I wanted to get you on the show now with, although the weather doesn't feel like it today, it is April, springtime just around the corner, and people are going to want to be getting getting outside again, which made me think about getting up north, vacation properties, uh, that type of thing. Walk me through this process. Is it feasible these days with prices the way they are for the average family to make something happen, Matt? Well, I think the biggest challenge that we have right now is just a lack of inventory. And, you know, we hear a lot on the news uh, where people talk about lack of inventory with homes. And I think we're all well aware of where, where we're at with that right now, but it also trickles over into vacant land, vacation properties and things like that. Um, So the biggest challenge is just going to be finding something uh, which is why you've got to have someone on your side that's looking all the time for you. How do you find these places? Well, I set up uh, automatic listing alerts after having a conversation with a family about what their goals are, what their 
you know, what they think they are, are looking for in the ideal situation. And it's, it's always a lot of fun listening to someone talk about their vision and talk about like, what's my perfect scenario if I, if I could have the perfect thing. And then, and then we try to broaden that search out a little bit just to make sure that we're not missing anything and then set up some listing alerts um, so that we get automatic notifications as quickly as possible. And then it's really just having your ear to the ground is, is really the last, the last part of that and being a part of conversations and in the right places at the right times where sometimes you find out about properties that are going to be listed that are not listed yet. And that can really give people an advantage. Is there a perfect time in someone's life to, to pull the trigger on something like this? I mean, if, if you're waiting for prices to come down, if you're waiting for availability to go up, you're for waiting for interest rates to bottom out again, you might spend your whole life just waiting, Matt. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great point, Mike, and that is a lot of where our conversations go and 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 interest rates are always a conversation and pricing right now is always a conversation and I, I just really try to help people understand that you don't you don't get these moments in time back. So whether you're retired and you're thinking about a place where your grandkids are going to want to come to grandma and grandpa's uh, to a cottage or to a piece of uh, hunting land or something like that. You don't get a second chance at that stuff. So sometimes you've got to look at where you're at, what season of life you're in and really make some decisions that are for the best of your family, because things like interest rates, we know they go up, we know they come down. So if you do buy at a slightly higher interest rate, you know, the goal there is going to be to watch those interest rates and, and refinance that property when the interest rates do come down. You you work across the state, but I know you do a lot of work in the mid-Michigan, central Michigan area. Um, when when the dams blew out and the, we lost the water in those lakes, that changed a lot of things in your world, didn't it? Is that what, What's the latest there, Matt? You got any inside scoop on that? Yeah, you know, and it's a it's an interesting perspective for me because um, not only do I deal with uh, the real estate aspect of those properties, but as you know, I live on what used to be Sanford Lake, now the good old Timidawasi River. Um, so it, it has a lot of impact for me personally, and I and I keep a, a real close eye on what's what's happening and what's going on. What I will tell you is that the market is really healthy for those properties. And I believe that the prices have been propped up by the promise of water coming back. Mm. So as long as we believe that we're still in a position in a situation where those lakes are going to return, then the property values will stay up. Now, they're not up as high as they would be if there was currently water there, but they also didn't plummet to the point that we thought they were going to when this first happened. And, and that is truly, in my opinion, because people see what's happening with the dam repair, they see what's happening with the money that has already been spent and, and by a lot of our, uh, a lot of our efforts to, to bring those lakes back. Matt, appreciate it. Got to let you go. Matt Smith Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. If you're looking for recreational property or a primary residence or place up north hunting property, Matt is your guy. It looks like we'll have Chris Durson after the break. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy. Thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show, heard on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. And I do firmly believe the best way to listen to this show, if you can, is on your local 
radio station, your local AM or FM station. You get your local news, your local weather, your local sports, even your local commercials. Maybe there's a sale or something, a service you want to take advantage of. I am a big fan of radio and encourage you to listen to this radio show on your local radio station. If you can't, if your local radio station doesn't carry all three hours of the show, or if you live in some part of our state not covered by the broadcast signal, it is nice to know there's a podcast version of the show available. You can hear that podcast on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. It's on my Facebook page. It's on Amazon Music, Audible, Twitter, now called X, LinkedIn, Apple Music, Google Play, yada, 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 Player FM, Deezer, Odyssey. It's even on YouTube. Regardless of how you are hearing my voice, I do certainly appreciate it. Wouldn't be able to do this for so many years without you uh, listening to the show. One of the uh, cool things, there's so many cool things about what I've been able to do throughout my career, but one of the things I've really enjoyed is establishing relationships and making friendships with people in the outdoor business. I love to work with Michigan-based family-owned companies. A few years ago, I uh, established a partnership with Rapid River Knives. You know, you, you know my shtick, my spiel, right? This sound right here, that's the sound of the Rapid River Knife coming out of my pocket and uh, locking back open. I carry a Rapid River Knife with me all the time. Chris Durson is the guy behind Rapid River Knives. Now, I am cautiously optimistic we're going to be able to talk to Chris. We've had this conversation scheduled for two weeks, but I got a text from Chris this morning, and it's no secret. We record the show midweek. I got a text from Chris. He said, Mike, I don't know if I can do it. We've had this massive winter storm in the UP, power's down at the shop. I said, Chris, if you can just try to find a spot and give us a cell signal, we'll take it. And Chris says he'll try it. So let's try it, Charlie. Chris Durson, how you doing? Welcome back to the show. Hey, Mike, I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> a lot better now that I hear your voice. <laughs> I'm here. We're hanging in there. We're, we're youpers. <laughs> uh, well, you're youpers and you're tough. But a storm like this in April, I mean, is, is it's not common, is it? Uh, not not one like this. It's uh, It started out uh, late last night with, with heavy rain and, and turned a wet, heavy snow with 35 to 45 mile an hour winds. So there's true, there are trees down everywhere. And I'd say about half of Delta County where we're at is without power right now. Wow. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been a challenging 12 hours to say the least. Yeah. Well, and, and as we're talking right now, the showroom's without power. I'm sure by the time the weekend rolls around, you'll be up and rolling and, 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 and running there at the shop. Yeah, I, absolutely. I don't, I don't see it taking that long, but I, you never know. This is a this is the worst one of the year, so uh, <laughs> we're keeping our fingers crossed. Well, let me ask you this: you know, it was such a mild winter, and everybody thought, well, the deer herd's going to be in great shape. But when you have a storm this late in the year, does it impact? How how does it does it hurt your deer herd? It, it definitely does. Uh, the deer are under the most stress at this time of year. Um, obviously we we haven't had any snow this winter and and not much in delta county where we're at um but their their bodies are under the most stress at this time of year and this kind of storm certainly doesn't help that um but with that being said there's warmer weather coming you know the deer are able to eat in the fields and just about anywhere right now um and they can move through the, the you know they've been able to move and get away from the predators and that type of thing so um, I think we're going to come out of it pretty good uh, compared to years past. Good deal. Good deal. Chris, tell me about Rapid River. How how did the company come to be? How did uh, you end up where you're at today? Well, it started uh, in 2001. I had just graduated from college, and um, I, I was working at Marble Arms in Gladstone at the time, and um, they, they chose to go down a different path, and I, I saw that there would be a uh, a big hole to fill for for custom knives, especially custom knives handmade in America. Uh, and so I I started the company in my garage uh, with one buffer and one grinder, thinking you know that you know I'd be the guy that that, that would fill that hole if it if it were to come up. And it certainly happened uh, within a year's time. Um, business was booming. We had moved to 
from a, the barn that I started in to our first retail location uh, in an old gas station uh, on the highway in Rapid River. Uh, and the, the turnout uh, to our store uh, was incredible and uh, actually overwhelming. So we outgrew that location in a hurry. And uh, our current location now is the, is the second retail location that we had. Um, and uh, we've since expanded that uh, tremendously since 2004. Uh, we now have the largest custom factory knife showroom in North America. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It yeah. is impressive. I mean, I, I say in the radio spot, I, it's, a, it's a destination. It is. It's, it's worth a trip downstate or from anywhere just to visit the shop. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's, it, a lot of people t- tell me that they feel like they're at a museum. We're in the store. When they're in the store, we have, you know, obviously now we, that we're stocked up after, you know, the Christmas rush and everything else, we, we've got a couple thousand knives uh, in the retail store. And uh, not just knives, but we've got, you know, a lot of our, you know, Rapid River gear and clothing and uh, a lot of real cool stuff to look at, too. Over, over 300 taxidermy mounts and woolly mammoth tusks and a lot of really neat, unique stuff that you normally wouldn't see anywhere else. Well, and and your knives reflect that you know unique stuff that you won't see anywhere else. This knife that I have in my hands right now that, that you guys made for me, I mean, what woolly woolly mammoth handle? How in the world do you get that stuff? Well, um, I started doing this probably the, 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 the really crazy custom knife handle stuff, the unique stuff, probably about fifteen years ago. Um, I noticed that a lot of knives on the market were just cookie cutter knives. You, you, you could see them anywhere. You could buy them anywhere. And I wanted, I wanted our products to just be really unique and stand out. So I just started thinking outside the box and coming up with really unique handle material that you wouldn't see anywhere else. And it started with some of the epoxies and the stabilized pine cones. And, and uh, eventually we got into the woolly mammoth stuff not knowing whether or not it would sell because it's not cheap, but it's definitely very unique. (laughs) It sure uh, is. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I started, I started uh, with some knives with mammoth tusk, mammoth ivory handles, uh, fossilized mammoth teeth. And it, it just went crazy. And um, so most of the ivory now comes from Alaska and Siberia. Um, We used to be able to get it out of Canada, but once, um, there was the big uh, elephant ivory ban, and uh, essentially every type of ivory except for mammoth was banned um, to use. Um, Canada decided that it was worth quite a bit of money, so they said that anybody that finds it in Canada has to turn it over to the government. Uh-huh. So that that source dried up. So now we have two spots that we can get it, and um, and surprisingly, they find quite a bit of it. So it's. It's a fun experience. I, I know some gold miners in, in Alaska, and we, we talk once a month, and and uh, whenever they find something fun, <laughs> I typically buy it. <laughs> well, I appreciate the fact, uh, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on was to, was to plug this new promo code. Um you have that you you've had a lot of people come to the shop and say hey Avery sent me here and even before we had the promo code Chris and I appreciate this folks have tell me tell me hey I stopped by the shop I mentioned your name and Rapid River gave me a discount so I thought well why don't we make something formal something official out of this and you have yeah definitely and and uh, every a lot of people have taken advantage of that since you announced it on that Wednesday night live oh good um, yeah we've had a lot of people on on our website use that code Avery ten so. It's definitely working, and people are, uh, you know, getting a ten percent off of a, any any of their purchases. So, what if we come into the store? Can we do the same thing? Absolutely. Yeah, just say I want the Avery code. I got a question for you. The website is it RapidRiverKnifeworks.us or is it RapidRiverKnifeworks.com? Uh, they both work. I own both domain names. Um, I uh, so. Either one. Okay. Okay. So RapidRiverKnifeworks.us. Use the promo code Avery10 to get 10% off. Um, Chris, listen, I'm, I'm so glad that the cell signal sounds so strong. 
I got to take a break. You know how this works. I got to take a break, but there are a lot more things I want to talk with you about if you can give me a few more minutes. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. All right. I appreciate that. We're talking with Chris Durson of Rapid River Knives, uh, the owner, the guy who started the company, the guy who has come up with all these cool designs, the guy who has grown the showroom into a destination, the guy who has officially now sanctioned the Avery 10 promo code. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us. Use the promo code Avery10 to get 10% off on your order. I would strongly encourage you, if you can, though, go to the showroom and check it out. You can see, you can see these knives being handmade by craftsmen. You can pick out your specific knife, and you can get it engraved. I bought a lot of these knives for my friends and uh, family, and everybody has been just so appreciative. They're a great product. They are a lifetime guarantee. We'll talk more about that after the break with Chris Durson of Rapid River Knives right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Tawas on WIOS. That's 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. You can hear us in Traverse City on WTCM, 580 AM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in Iron Mountain, WMIQ, 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by VersaSkins, Michigan-based, family-owned VersaSkins. You know I love that. Why buy a bunch of different sets of hunting clothes when you can buy one good quality set and snap on and zip on an outer shell to change your pattern. Just change your skin for the season you're in. Go to the website, VersaSkins.com. That's VersaSkins.com. Um, if you need big sizes, 4, 5, 6X, VersaSkins can help you out. If you are a saddle hunter, VersaSkins now makes a saddle hunting jacket. VersaSkins.com, VersaSkins.com. Hey, breaking news as we are recording this show. By now you've heard about this, but I just got an email from the DNR that they say that a hunter killed a wolf in Calhoun County. It's been confirmed with DNA. Coming up in our third hour, Brian Roll from the DNR has agreed to jump on the phone line, and we'll talk more about that. So just a heads up. Speaking of the UP right now, I'm talking with Chris Durson of Rapid River Knives, rapidriverknifeworks.us. Use the promo code Avery10 to save 10%. Hey, Chris, what makes, a simple question, but I don't know if there's a simple answer, what makes a good knife? Well, you definitely have to start with the right steel. Um, you can you can make anything look pretty, but if you know if you don't start with the right steel for edge retention and you know blade uh, life, um, you, you're not you're not going to get anywhere with it, and you won't get re- return customers. So you have to start with good, high quality steel. We like to use uh, carbon tool steels. Um, they have great edge retention. They last a long time and uh, uh, that's why we offered, you know, 100% lifetime warranty on it, on everything we make. Do, you know? do, do you, is there a happy medium between having it soft enough to put an edge on it and hard enough to keep an edge? Are you are you kind of b- making a balancing act right there? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You, uh, so our fixed blade hunting knives are all heat treated to 58, 60 Rockwell. Um, that's uh, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's just a hard a hardening system that, that you know you use for knife steels and stuff like that. And um, it, it is a it is a balance. If you get it too soft, you're going to roll your edge over the first time you use it, and if you get it hard, it's going to be too brittle and it may chip or crack. So, um, yeah, we we heat our stuff to 5860 Rockwell, and that's been doing that now for 23 years. We don't have any problems with it, other than. The occasional guy that tries to pry a car trunk open or something <laughs> like that with it, and, you know, does something silly. Um, but even even then, we uh, you know if, they're, if people are honest with us and t- tell us what they did with it, we will replace it if something happens. So, lifetime and, guarantee. And, and, I love that. Yeah, definitely. And um, that's just uh, we've always done that from day one. I, I good customer service is extremely hard to find, and we, we pride ourselves on. And taking care of everybody, and um, I know how, how hard it was to start the company and to and to you know get it on its feet and to get new customers and uh, and and to keep them. So that uh, is very important to us, uh, the quality and and the, the people are happy with them. I mean, these are generational knives. Uh, we've got 
our first customers are bought their sons and daughters knives and now they're coming in and buy their sons and daughters knives so it's uh it's definitely fun to watch and um it's an honor to 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 be able to do that I always say a good knife is one of the most valuable tools anybody can have. I mean, I carry my Rapid River knife with me, Chris, every day, all day long, regardless of where I am. Well, anywhere I, I certainly can. Um, but the thing I wonder, I mean, this knife I have is so beautiful and it's so rare. At first, I was afraid to use it. And you said, don't ever be like that. Use our knives. They're designed to be used. Yes, definitely. I mean, and we get that a lot because, you know, we like, we do start with the great, you know, the good tool steels, so we're not worried about the blades. And we make the handles real pretty and fancy, but they're ultimately designed to be used. So the Mammoth Ivory is actually stabilized. Um, we stabilize it and um, harden it so that if there are, I mean, especially in the ivory, you're going to get, I mean, it's 40, 50, 60,000 years old. There's going to be natural cracks in it and stuff like that, but there's nothing to worry about it. it uh, it's all, it's, it's it's gonna it's gonna last. It's gonna outlast um, me. I'm pretty it, sure of that. It's gonna outlast me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, in yeah. a in a in a conversation, a phone conversation we had a few weeks ago, you were telling me that that the you know the the size knife that I have right now is a pretty good size knife. It's got a pocket clip on it. I mean, I'm very comfortable with it. But you said that the trend lately has been in the uh, toward the smaller version of this, a, a smaller folding knife. Is that still holding true? It is, and uh, so we make uh, the, the two most popular pocket knives that we that we made were the one that you have, which is our Uper pocket clip, and then we had the mini Uper, which was um, uh, more of a, a dress knife, not for utility work or field dressing animals, but just kind of an everyday carry. Uh, uh, so we 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 basically took your knife, the Uper pocket clip, and and made a fifty percent version of that. Uh, that's, that's smaller, but still has the pocket clip on it. If you don't want the weight down inside your pocket, your jeans. I'm, I'm looking at my knife right now. If you cut this thing in half, that's a pretty small knife. But really, when you think about the the part of the blade that you use, there's, I don't care what you're doing, you're not usually using that whole blade. You're probably just using the end of it anyway. Yeah, and any blade, typically, when I mean, you're you're only using about three-quarters of an inch at the end. Uh, of, the, of the blade so we don't really make too many big knife long knives blades other than our big salmon fillets and our offshore stuff um just because anybody that uses a knife a lot knows that a, a huge blade just gets in the way and they're not practical for anything other but than for for a show knife or yeah. display knife how do you guys in the shop put that famous edge that you have everybody every time i give a rapid river knife to somebody they go holy cow this thing is sharp how do you do that well we start we, we, we grind everything by hand um we don't use any jigs or anything like that we grind everything by hand on uh, two by 72 inch uh grinder uh, sanding belts and we start the initial grind with a with an 80 grit belt and it, we work it all the way up to a 2000 grit ceramic belt so um, we um, we use that. Uh, once it's ground on the 2,000 grit ceramic belt, there's still a microscopic burr on the blade. So we take it to a series of buffing wheels that basically power strops, uh, like a barber would use on a on a uh, straight razor, but they're cloth wheels, and we put buffing compound on it and get rid of that last little tiny burr that's left on the blade. If you don't use a jig to keep that angle, then how do you how do you know what angle to put on it, and how do you keep that angle? Is that just from years and years of doing it? Yeah, in my case, uh, pushing thirty years of practice, it's, <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, and uh, it, typically when we get a new guy or somebody that we're trying to train on how to sharpen a knife and how to uh, from from the initial grind to the end. Um, it can take three to five years of wow. work with that with that person to 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 where we're comfortable with it uh, leaving our store. Yeah. So when it leaves your store, you could shave with it. How do we keep an edge on that knife after we carry it every day and use it every day? How do we keep it sharp? 
it's actually uh, easier than most people would think. And, and the reason for that is a lot of people will use a knife and they'll use it until it's completely dull and they can't cut anything with it. But if you occasionally strop that blade on a piece of leather, a, a, you know, a, a belt, um, even um, a Carhartt uh, um, jeans or anything that's kind of rough, um, strop it and, you know, and break that little burr off before it gets turns into a big burr. Um, you can maintain that edge for a long time before you actually have to send it in or have to sharpen it yourself. So when you strop it, are you pushing the blade into the material or pulling it away? Both. I, you, uh, I push it and pull it. Uh, really, uh, it's all you're trying to do is just just break that little tiny burr that you really you can feel the roughness with your fingernail if you're running up and down the blade if it's rough then that means you have a little burr that's forming on the end of your blade so if you just drop it back and forth um, eventually you're going to break that off and you're going to have a real crisp edge again i do it you know i i've been using the same knife for several years now i mean it's gone through a couple of big mountain lions and a dozen whitetail and all i've done to it is drop it uh, I still haven't put it back on, on the, the grinding belt. Really? Wow. I'll strop it after every whitetail I do, you know, four or five times, clean it up, re-oil the blade, and uh, uh, it's it's still going strong. And every, everybody's knife can do that. You can do that with your kitchen knives, anything you have. If you strop it uh, occasionally and just take care of it, uh, you can you can catch it before that big burr breaks off and, not, and you have a rounded edge, which needs to be reground. Well, and you guys make kitchen knives too, right? Yes, we have a full line of kitchen cutlery. Hmm. And hatchets and axes, and any, I always say anything with a blade. That, have you, anything with a blade, yes. Yeah, we make pack axes and um, regular axes. We even make the little miniature axes that are like uh, little replica axes are the ones that we, are bigger ones that we make. Okay, so if by chance I did let my blade get a little dull, can I send it back to you or just make a drive to the showroom and will you touch it up for me? Yes, uh, we do it every single day. Uh, now that uh, now that we have uh, been in business for so long, we we have you know a half a million knives out there. We get knives back every day to be touched up, sharpened, polished, and when they come in, even if they come in for a sharpening. People can they mail them to us from all over the world. Uh, we we redo the whole knife, even if you don't ask for it. So we we resharpen the blades, polish up the handles, and they they they're they they return to you like the day you bought them, uh, brand new. So we polish all the brass and the thumb guards and the bolsters and and everything. And if if you're driving by our factory store, if you stop in with your knife. It's about a five to ten minute job, depending on the condition it's in, and uh, you walk out of there with a with a new knife again. Yeah. Well, Chris Durson, uh, you run a great company. You make great products. RapidRiverKnifeworks.us. That's RapidRiverKnifeworks.us. Use the promo code Avery10 to save ten percent at checkout. Better yet, go to the showroom on US two, just east of Rapid River. Chris, I appreciate you um, your flexibility this morning. I wish you luck on getting uh, dug out from the snow, and we'll talk again soon. That sounds good. Thanks, Mike. All right, Chris Durson of Rapid River Knives. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, Amy Trotter of MUCC. I want to talk with her about the lawsuit against the NRC over the coyote hunt. And we do have the DNR biologist to talk about wolves in our number three, wolves in, a wolf in Calhoun County. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Flint on Sports Extra, 1330 WTRX. And you can hear us, uh, let's go uh, to Escanaba, the Riviera of the North, WCHT, 600 AM, 93.5 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Killer Food Plots. Getting to be that time. Now, I realize the weather hasn't been real conducive to putting in food plots, but it's going to change just around the corner. If you're going to put the time and effort and expense into putting in food plots, 
I think you should work with a uh, good company, reputable company. Rich Krizan, the owner of Killer Food Plots, does a great job. I would encourage you to check out the website, KillerFoodPlots.com. KillerFoodPlots.com to see what product is available. You can also have Rich come out to your property, do a consult, even do the work. Uh, KillerFoodPlots.com. We will get Rich back on the show here in the next couple of weeks to help us get ready for food plot planting season. But in the meantime, we have the executive director of MUCC, Michigan United Conservation Clubs, MUCC.org. Um, with us on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Uh, sorry, I got to check something here real quick. I apologize, Amy. Um, anyway, Amy Trotter is with us. Amy, welcome back. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Always a pleasure, and I really appreciate your time because I know just how incredibly busy you have been lately. You got a lot of things going on right now. <laughs> we do, that is for sure. So where are we at, Amy? I don't feel, well, you're making friends in some circles, and you're making people mad in others, and I'm thinking about the recent action against the NRC. That's correct. We officially filed a, a lawsuit against the Natural Resources Commission in Ingham County on uh, April Fool's Day, but it was no <laughs> joke. Tell us, I, I mean, I've been following this pretty closely, but bring us up to speed for folks who are wondering what's going on. What is going on? I mean, I thought, I thought MUCC and NRC, Natural Resources Commission and Michigan United Conservation Clubs, I thought you guys worked together. We absolutely do. And in this case, uh, you know, we, we strongly disagree with the decision that was made by the NRC. So to take you back a little bit, we do fur bearer regulations every two years. Yep. We lose Jamie? Oh, it sounds like we did. Just <laughs> out of the blue. Uh, Charlie's going to have to call her back. You know, the interesting thing is, Charlie, she was telling me. It. Oh, there, Amy, you're back. Oh, Amy, I'm sorry. Oh. Your, your phone just absolutely cut out. You were talking about. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Problem with your cell phone and, <laughs> and your landline. Man. Let, oh, let, let, let's, let's go back to fur bearer every two years. That's the last we heard. Okay. The, the DNR takes a look at and brings together a group called the Fur Takers Work Group every two years, and they put forward ideas that go through a regulation cycle uh, with the Natural Resources Commission. We had a proposal this year to actually take a look at closing the season for coyotes, which has been year-round for the last seven years, and closing that period between mid-April to mid-July. And the reason stated for this closure was really due to public perception. And that's where, you know, again, this is bigger than coyote management. This is something that we feel strongly is not a good reason to take away opportunity and to close a season based on that public perception that was cited. Public perception. We don't want our wildlife policies based on public perception. That's, 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 just think about where that could lead. This was the whole reason for Proposal G in 1996, because there was a group of anti-hunters that wanted to cut off certain methods of bear hunting. They wanted to get rid of bait and they wanted to get rid of hounds. And we offered Proposal G as an alternative because we said that we wanted wildlife management decisions to be rooted in sound scientific principles and not to be, you know, what is effectively known as ballot box biology, where we're taking everything through a lens of public perception and seeing what is popular or what is not on any given issue. So you guys filed. Didn't uh, Trappers and Predator Callers Association also file? Correct. They filed in Mackinac County and MUCC filed in Ingham County. So is this part, uh, are you guys working together? Is this part of an organized effort? Well, certainly they're a member organization of us, and they were with us side by side in the testimony uh, at the NRC. Um, so we did file separately because they're registered uh, in in Mackinac County, and we're you know a Lansing based gotcha. Kingdom County organization. So what next? Where does this go? Well, so the the request here is 
Um, and it had to be made within 21 days of the decision. So this was quickly moving, um, and really all we have filed is a, is a, a letter of intent, if you will, mm -hmm. which uh, requests the official record and transcript for the decision that was made by the Natural Resources Commission on this issue. So um, it's going to take a while, we expect, for that uh, administrative record to be produced. And then we will, you know, follow that, and I believe we have uh, about a month to uh, produce briefs in relation to, you know, what we read in the administrative record. Excellent, Amy. I will stand by and wait to hear more on that. i got to take a break. You know how this works. If you can stand by, I've got a few more questions for you. We're talking with Amy Trotter, Executive Director of MUCC, MUCC.org, MUCC.org. In my opinion, if you've ever thought about becoming an MUCC member, now is a really good time to do that. We'll take a break. More with Amy Trotter right here on Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on the Twister 92.1 WTWS. You can hear us in Holland on WHTC 1450 AM 99.7 FM. I thought we could go. Oh, yeah, we can go north of the bridge at least one more time. Let's go to Manistique WTIQ 1490 AM 95.3 FM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by the folks at Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoors men and women and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way this works is you send me an email to mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com, either a question I can answer directly or something you want me to pass along to somebody else. That's what Terry Walters did. Terry sent me an email to mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. He says, hey, Mike, I saw your video about the politicians in Lansing cutting back on the coyote season. Now, I'm not a predator hunter, but this decision really bothers me. What bothers me more is I don't feel like there's anything we can do about the direction we're headed. I don't trust the NRC or the DNR and certainly not the politicians. But honestly, what can we do about it? I don't want to do something crazy like marching on Lansing or something like that, but I do want to do my part. What do you suggest? This leads perfectly into our conversation right now with Amy Trotter, Executive Director of MUCC. Amy, what can Terry do? What can I do? What can all of us do? Well, I think, you know, for the immediate need is to join MUCC and support our organization in this endeavor. I mean, the thing that we know here in Michigan and throughout the country is that hunters and trappers and anglers are at a disadvantage to the rest of the population that would, uh, you know, seek to remove these kinds of opportunities from us. Um, we are underfunded and undermanned, and we have fewer lawyers than they do of the other side. So it is important to have a strong backbone uh, for the conservation-minded folks here in Michigan. And the best way to do that, again, is joining MUCC and groups like us um, because we're the ones paying attention to these kinds of things and, and watching them and letting people know about them. I, I would surmise that very few people would even know this decision was going forward if we weren't there live streaming all the meetings and sending out press releases letting people know it was happening. But second to that, I think we do need to take a look at the Natural Resources Commission. And again, I'm not trying to diminish the importance of having wildlife and fisheries decisions made by a commission style of governance. It is much for it is far superior to working with seven people than it is 148 legislators downtown. Or the alternative is a single DNR director uh, with unilateral authority. So, you know, it's, it's that decision-making style that we have here in Michigan and in a lot of other states that, again, it isn't perfect, but it is far superior, I believe, to the other alternatives. So we do need to make sure, though, that this commission and future commissions and the people who are appointed to serve on that are, you know, understanding the intent of Proposal G, are understanding um, who all of our groups are and that they are, you know, bound by 
law to make the best decisions uh, based on you know sound scientific management. So we need to communicate that to the commission, keep regularly communicating with the commission, get to know these commissioners. I think that is effective, um, even if you are a general citizen. Uh, you know, if you have an opinion on something before them, to engage with them, um, they they are you know citizens as well. Uh, so you know they are they are just usually <laughs> regular people, and uh, you can call them and, and chat about the decisions in front of them, um, civilly of course. But I, I do think it's important again to engage and not to uh, sit on the bench. Uh, because that's the worst thing we can do as hunters and anglers and trappers is is to really just uh, you know throw our hands up and give up and disengage. I, I don't want to be too negative here, but I feel like we're at a pivotal point right now. I would agree. I I think again, and I as I said earlier, I think this litigation is bigger than coyotes. It is about, you know, sort of what we need to do to shore up our processes, our decision making, and and perhaps our science. You know, if there are gaps in information, we should be seeking, you know, funds and opportunities to fill that knowledge gap. So I I do think, you know, it it is probably multi layered in its um, in intent and, and my hope is for positive outcomes on all of those things. Well my hope is for positive outcomes as well. On a different note, Amy, what are you doing this summer? Say Monday, July twenty seventh. You got any plans? Monday, July 29th, 29th. I believe. 29th. I will Thank be. you for that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Thank you. laughs> Hopefully I've got my calendar no, right. <laughs> I I can't say I'll be golfing, but I can say that I'll be at a golf course and having a great time with you and the folks at the West Branch Country Club. That's right. I appreciate it. I've got I have another event that Saturday. Yes, Monday, July 29th, the first annual Mike Avery Outdoors golf outing at the West Branch Country Club with all funds going to benefit MUCC's youth camp. Details on that coming up. Amy, I will look forward to seeing you there, and I will look forward to having you back on the air here very soon. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. Amy Trotter, MUCC, Executive Director, MUCC.org, MUCC.org. Only cost a few bucks to join. Strength in numbers, and we need those numbers right now. We'll take a break for the top of the hour. When we come back, Mark Martin talking about springtime fishing. Then Brian Roll from the DNR, a last-minute addition to the show, talking about that wolf killed by a hunter in Calhoun County. Plus, Dixie Dave. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay's Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. Yep, it's a radio show, all right. In a world of podcasting, this is a radio show. But it's also made available as a podcast. I want to make the content of this show, the subjects of this show, the information from this show available as many places as possible. And it's it's fun for a guy like me who is a geek at heart, who is a tech guy at heart, who is a broadcaster at heart, a communicator at heart, to look at the different ways to reach people these days. I mean, back in the early days, right, when I was – early days of my outdoor television career, we would take – we, I, and a handful of other people – a great big old TV camera on my right shoulder. weighed about 25 pounds. 
a record a video recording deck on a strap on my left shoulder. Weighed about 25 pounds, maybe 20 pounds. It was big. It was cumbersome. Cumbersome. The quality of the video wasn't very good. And it made it really challenging uh, on some of the shoots that I, you know, used to like to do. If you went to a city council meeting or something like that, no big deal. But say, for example, that you wanted to shoot a, a story or a show fishing with, oh, say, Mark Martin. And say you were fishing the Muskegon Channel after dark. And had that big camera on one side, big recorder on the other. But still, we made it work. And in this case, we caught fish. These days, if I went out there, I'd use my phone. And it would be so much easier, and the quality of the video would be so much better. But the experience would be the same. When I look back at that first, well, that trip I made, exactly with, with my dad when he was still around, we went walleye fishing on the Muskegon Channel with Mark Martin. I knew Mark before then. I had interviewed him before then. I had talked to him several times before then. I had fished with him before then. But it was that night when I saw just how deep his knowledge, how intense his emotions, and how specific his actions are on the water. And that's when I really, really became impressed. So I thought, you know, springtime fishing here, or soon will be, no better time to talk with Mark Martin than this weekend right here on Outdoor Magazine. Mark, welcome back. How are you? Hey, not too bad. Hey, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, I appreciate that. Do you remember that night? You like I know something. Do you remember that? <laughs> do you do you remember that night fishing with my dad out yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, I remember your dad and you. That was a fun time, <laughs> as <laughs> usual. I, all of our experiences were were entertaining, and uh, you know, we threw around a lot of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, we threw around a lot of something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, I gotta, you know, I gotta great. ask. Um, with the lack of winter that we had, how did that affect your ice fishing schools? Uh, what ice fishing schools? <laughs> there wasn't none. It, it affected them to the point where they were, you know, uh, history. You know, we, we, I'd, I'd laugh about it because if I don't, I'd cry. I don't want to cry on air here. <laughs> so you, you weren't able to do any of them, Mark? No, no. Uh, there wasn't not a – there might have been a brief um, – amount of ice but not enough ice that i would dare take people out on with their equipment and safely navigate a body of water or body of ice and expect that somebody wasn't going to get hurt yeah yeah so i said no no and the the rest of my pro staff said the same thing we can't do it so we picked up and uh you know they all were jonesing for ice and so i I said to them, I said, they were saying, well, let's go here, let's go there, let's go here. let's." And they were all marginal errors, and maybe we could get in trouble where we were talking about. I said, hey, you guys all wanted to go back to Winnebagosh in Minnesota. And they went, huh? I said, yeah, they got 21 inches of solid black ice over mm. there. They're driving trucks. I said, you guys want to go? And 19 of my pro staff said, a, I'm in, and we all went, which now they understand where the school started was on Winnebagash with Gary Roach and Al Linder, and they always heard me talking about it, and not one of them had ever visited the lake, knew where it even was, and now they can talk with authority of, I've been there, I've done it, and so they want to, you know, they, and so when we are in seminars or they're talking with people about the school, they can uh, be authorities on where we were. So we went there, and we caught a bunch of fish. And, of course, uh, uh, a couple of the guys, because they've made friends with some of the students, kind of let them in on it. And those students up and came with us, <laughs> not because I invited them to come, but, you know, they, you know, because I don't want to f- make the other students that found out about it feel that we shied at them. So it, was, they, it wasn't an official school. No, no, it wasn't. But they got to meet Gary Roach. He came. And How's Gary with, doing? How's Gary doing? He's doing really good. 87 years old, still ice fishing, still <laughs> open water fishing. He guides sometimes three days a week. Oh, my goodness. I know. 
and, and he doesn't have any uh, sugar diabetes anymore. Wow. I, I remember early, early on when the walleye first came back to Saginaw Valley, basically, we'll call it. Yeah. Fishing with you guys up in the Titabawassee, and Gary was throwing like 16th ounce jigs. I said, yeah. Gary, what, how, how? And he said, back then the theory was go as light as you can, go as light as you can. But I'll never forget watching him finesse fishing walleye out of the uh, Saginaw and the Titabawassee River. It was, it was a wonderful thing to watch. It's an uh, artistic moment. Yes, right? yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. You know, he taught me a lot of stuff where, you know, I needed to, you know, feel bottom, not necessarily. You just needed to feel the jig and and and, and don't need to feel bottom. You just got to feel what that jig's doing. It'll get to the bottom, even though you can't feel bottom with it. <laughs> and know the angle of the, the current. So yeah, you know, it's, it's all an artistic way to do it. Now we're all going bigger again, yep, you know, yep. and, and thump the, the bottom, thump the bottom, thump the bottom. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and I tell people that too, you know, if you can't do it tiny, which I, I used to fish the Detroit river with eight ounce jigs and can <laughs> do it. And now I'd rather use an ounce three quarters, you know, a jig because I realize that, you know, a big profile, big thumping catches you more fish in shorter order than the tiny jigs that don't make as much noise, aren't as big as profile. You catch fish on them, and it's a lot harder to stay vertical with little stuff. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Big, so now how do we get over onto that? I don't know. I, I never know where our conversation is going to go. But I, 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 I do want to go back to ice fishing, though. Does the lack of ice this winter somehow affect our springtime fishing, or is it not a factor at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, things, um, you know, I have already, you know, somewhat started. You know, they, you know, they're spawning now. I mean, Normally it would be delayed, and I talked to a few people up in the Keweenaw, and uh, they inadvertently uh, have caught some walleyes, you know, out at the while well, they're fishing for splake and some other things at the mouths of these rivers and stuff, and uh, they've actually seen them spawning too. Um, you know, they they go down with their so they're they're spawning right now. At, at different areas of Michigan and different areas of the country. Well, if we take your show and we go back down to uh, what, Arkansas, mm-hmm. the Greer's, Greer's Ferry, they're, they're almost, yeah, they're almost done spawning. I mean, we had a great film session down there too. And, and, uh, you know, it didn't really prove Al Linder wrong, but impressed him with as many fish as we caught, let alone had hits from. You know, I think he uh, predicted that when we went down there, if we caught a couple fish, we were doing good, and we did better than that, and we had a lot more fish that we didn't hook, you know, so he was, so yeah, we, that was a good exploratory at Greer's Ferry, and uh, it, was, it was a fun time like everything else that we've done, but no, I, it's uh, the, you know, they, they, they're they done way down there, and now we, as you move further north, you know, but now without the ice and snow cover, the light penetration is is better because that works on their psyche too of these fish. They they get up early. By the time the season opens up, in some places May fifteenth or the end of April, May fifteenth in the UP, the end of April in the Lower Peninsula. Um, these fish are going to be done, so they're going to be acting um, a little bit different. Hmm. You know, they're, they're still going to be fish checking out the shallows and the rocks and the reefs just because their smell is there, and the males are always going to go in there, and, you know, it's kind of like hunting. You know, the the, the bucks, are, if there's a doe in heat somewhere, they're going to search her out, you know, and it's not done until they're done. Yep, yep. So, uh, Hang tight, Mark. Hang tight. Listen, we got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. We're talking with Mark Martin. You know Mark. He's been around the Michigan fishing world forever. A couple of websites for him, markmartins.net, markmartins.net, and fishingvacationschool.com, fishingvacationschool.com. Mark was not able to do his ice fishing trips, but he will be able to do his open water trips this summer. For details on those, go to the website, fishingvacationschool.com. We'll take a break when we come back. More with Mark Martin right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can 
here the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on 98.5 WUPS. You can hear us in Lansing, WILS 1320 AM. And you can hear us in Manistee, WMLQ 97.7 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. Reader can take care of your lawn and property because it's your nature and our nurture. Let them create an outdoor getaway in your backyard. And this is the time to be getting in touch with the folks at Reader. I've been talking to Paul Reader and the folks over there about some things that uh, we are working on this spring, including just routine maintenance and trimming of trees and lawn maintenance and maybe a little bit of a second part of a landscaping project as well, whether it's your primary home or your place up north, your cottage, whatever, uh, there's a good chance Reader can help you out with it. Their uh, teams are hardworking people. They know what they're doing, um, and I strongly recommend them. The website, ReaderLandscaping.com. That's ReaderLandscaping.com. Of course, my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. But as you're out there poking around the vast wasteland, wasteland of the Internet, it's not a wasteland, but, you know, as long as you go to the right places. MarkMartins.net is one website you'll want to check out. The other one, FishingVacationSchool.com, FishingVacationSchool.com. Those are both websites for Mark Martin, who is with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. All right, Mark, uh, as folks are listening to the show this weekend, yeah, maybe they're looking for some place to go fishing now. Maybe they're looking for some place to go fishing in the next week or so. What's your, uh, what's your uh, best advice right now? Well, if they're after walleyes, uh, uh, stay out of the inland lakes and look at the Great Lakes, uh, the rivers that are open. Uh, they're going to be hot and heavy now that the Saginaw doesn't close. Uh, they're, they're full of fish. All these places where the fish are going to spawn are going to be the magnets to there. Otherwise, uh, you know, they, they inhabit, uh, um, you know, like in Lake Michigan, uh, the drowned river mouth lakes like Muskegon and Manistee and Holland and all these lakes that are inland that have a channel that go out to Lake Michigan are attracting the walleyes in. Well, there will probably, there'll probably be a few people, but a lot of people forget about going out and trolling around there or casting the mouth. As long as you don't break the shoreline, you're you're totally a legal beagle out there so you know casting is going to be good up along the outsides of the piers and along you know wherever there's rocks and and uh, gravelly areas you're going to find i have a few friends that are are doing that right now and they're probably going to hear this on your show (laughs) and they're going to be really (laughs) bummed at me going I had it all to myself until you said something, Mark. <laughs> but that's my job is to teach people and, and let people in on the newest and latest and greatest places to go to. Let's talk more about this uh, surf fishing or pier fishing. So what would your setup be? Would you have, have one dead rod basically out there laying on the bottom with live bait and then throw, uh, throw a spinner or a Cleo or something? Well, I, I personally, well, you could do it with uh, your waders and, and if you can get, you know, uh, you know, off of the, where the piers come out and cast, I would just cast stick baits, mm-hmm. cast stick baits. And when you're casting that, or you can, you know, do a uh, little deep diver shad wraps or something like that, but stick baits such as floating rapalas, husky jerks, that type of thing right there. And then you, you don't need to be weighting these things down because they're coming in shallow and you want to kind of, you know, target them at night because that's when they're going to come in and spawn and they're going to be the, the most abundant, I guess, because that's when they like to spawn is under the cover of darkness and and everything. So if you target these new places I'm talking about, that's when you want to do it under the cover of darkness, stick baits. And when you're throwing them out and working them, reel them really, really slow. I mean, if you watched how you do it at night, and I, I never was able to take a lot of people at night out night fishing, casting, 
because my insurance would go out of this world because they're afraid people are going to be hooking each other, which probably would have happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'd left them in the water and they were happy with me. But, you know, I like to cast and my buddies, they, they do a lot of casting nowadays. And they, it's, it's a talent that at night when you're casting, you know, most people reel like they're fishing in the daytime and they fish them, their baits way too fast. And you got to, it may take uh, for a normal flip out a husky jerk and reel it in. It probably will take you, if you're fishing it right, probably about three minutes to reel back in. Really? <laughs> Maybe you better edit that out of your. <laughs> no, no, I'm just thinking, boy, you know, I, I, well, I'm used to looking at crankbaits at trolling speeds. So you're talking about just a little wobble, just a little wobble back and forth. And floating to the top or just not really doing anything except moving in the wake of the waves or, wow. you know, and they're coming up and snatching it kind of like a bass taking a plug off. A top surface. water walleye bite? <laughs> yep, pretty much. I've had them just, it sounds like a bass hit. And then you, and if you set the hook when you hear it, and then you miss them. <laughs> wow. You got to feel that tug. Tug is a drug. Let's set the hook. <laughs> well, you uh, you certainly made your bones night fishing. I mean, when you talk about night fishing for walleye, that's what put you on the map, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it did. You know, I, I understood because back then walleyes were like a unicorn. You know, they – not too many people caught them, and if they did, they didn't catch them consistently. It was like, oh, I got one this year. I got two. Mm -hmm. they limit, that would be out of the world, you know. But I would go out and, you know, because my dad and grandpa, you know, it wasn't me. It was them teaching me how to do it and where to do it, and and I could take it anywhere after that and do it wherever there was walleye, and it got dark, and it was the easiest I mean, it's not like I can't couldn't catch them in the daytime, but it was definitely much harder, you know. And you might as well go when it's easier uh, to target the species you're after because you're going to be more successful then. Well, you know, they let... I, I like to tell the story about, you know, you were a very well-known and accomplished uh, night fisherman for walleye. Then you went on the tournament trail, and a lot of people said, yeah, he's a good stick at night, but he'll never catch him in the daytime. And you went out that same year and won the first annual professional walleye national championship. So you proved you could. But how did yeah. how did you make that transition from night fishing to the day? What what what's involved in that? I guess I could always do well all twenty four hours, but it was when I was restricted to six hours a guide trip, six hours. I realized if I'm going to be catching the biggest fish in the most fish i'm going to do it at night and that got me well known because that, that you know and catching the most making the state of michigan change the master angler limit eventually up to 11 pounds while i was guiding you know because i, I it was too easy they seen it that i've made it for everybody i know I mark, mark martin and the muskegon channel made the the michigan master angler walleye limit size limit go from nine pounds up to 10 and then up to 11 yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was uh, you know, it first started out at eight, and then at nine, and then oh, it went really? to ten, wow. and then it went. Well, yeah, right, exactly. You know, that was a big fish, eight pounds back. Now, eight pounds is an everyday. Everybody catches them, you know. And so, but yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I kind of thought that was pretty cool job much harder <laughs> do you think we will ever see our state record walleye what is it 17.3 or 17.9 whatever yeah. will we will we see that broken um because i i, I tell you what um if, until a couple of years ago i never would have thought we'd see the king salmon state record broken either so right. it, 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 is that is she out there somewhere do you think oh yeah yeah and it's been caught but by people that don't realize what they've caught uh, or they've caught it and it's out of season. That's for the, the majority of them probably have been, but there have been a few caught within the seasons and they uh, you know, just aren't reported or they are taking a picture of them after they caught them, had, didn't get them officially weighed and then they weigh them and they're not, they're just under 17.3. And that 17.3 was caught in 1956 
behind the uh, Manistee Dam on the Hoden pile. I remember that story. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't around, but I remember the story. Um, yeah. This is a, a cliche question, but I'm going to ask you anyway, as long as we're talking about big fish. What's the biggest walleye you've ever caught? 14 one. I know. And when I was 12, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long time ago. Yeah. And, and I, I had bigger ones in my boat that I got people master anglers for, but personally I didn't uh, reel them in. So they, uh, they, they were, you know, uh, registered by somebody else, but not, no, I mean, that 14 one, I was 12 years old and my dad and I asked my dad and grandpa, cause that's who I was with. And, they, you know, and they, I knew it wasn't anything bigger than they ever caught because I've seen them catch bigger ones. So I said, "Oh, can I get that mounted?" And they looked at me and they go, "You're 12 years old." I remember <laughs> it like, "Yes, you're gonna get a bigger one before." <laughs> <laughs> it never did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that's that's I mean, a great story. That's a great story. <laughs> hey, before we run out of time, um, fishing vacation school is coming up for open water. What do you got coming up? Well, I have on uh, June six. Let's see, I I better look right here real quick. It's June over at Linwood Beach Marina. I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> we got one school. Uh, that we're going to do this year, oh, the 9th through the 12th. So, I'm, And we'll start on a Sunday and end on a Wednesday. And uh, the cost per boat in person is uh, 875 And it's uh, we take your equipment and set it up so we know we can see fish with it. And we fish in your boat with you with your equipment. And so when we're done... You've used with and you've fished with four of the best fishermen that I know in your boat with your equipment. So when we're done, you could go out and fish a tournament, which a couple people have, and one of them won a tournament right after, <laughs> and they didn't know nothing about what we taught them. And they were, you know, I they went out and fished a tournament on Saginaw Bay a couple days after they finished the school and won. Wow. I mean, so that it shows you what you can learn in that school with your own boat. It's better than going with us in our boats on a guide trip because Absolutely. you're using our equipment. Yeah. We're setting your equipment up to be a tournament. Mark, uh, I got to let you go. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I got to let you go because I got, I got Brian Roll from the DNR coming up next about a, a wolf that a hunter killed down in Calhoun County. So i got to make room for that. I'll talk to you again, my friend, Mark Martin, markmartins.net, fishingvacationschool.com. We will take that break. I can't wait to hear the story of this Calhoun County wolf. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. You can hear us in Port here on WPHM 1380 AM. And you can hear us in Saginaw on WSGW 790 AM 100.5 FM. I'm in the studios of SGW right now recording this week's show. I get an email from a buddy. He forwards it and says, hey, did you hear about this wolf taken by a hunter in Calhoun County? I'm thinking you're crazy. No, there's no wolves in Calhoun County. So I look at the news release. Brian Roll's name is on it. I call Brian and say, can we talk about this? He said, I got about seven minutes. I said, that's long enough. Brian Roll, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, thanks for having me. A <laughs> little busy there this morning? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it a little busy. A lot of, lot of media requests. So tell me the story. This is, uh, I, I would never believe it if, I, if it wasn't coming from you guys. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that when I first was uh, alerted to the presence, I mean, you know, this is like uh, late January, somebody showed me the pictures that were floating around social media, um, and I was like, Calhoun County, I was like, you got to be kidding me, and, um, you know, so the first thing I saw was like, well, that looks like a wolf, not a coyote, and um, so sure enough, we had it, we tested it at two different labs um, and it came back as a Great Lakes wolf, which is what, what I expected. Uh, so it's still an active investigation on how it may have got there. Um, so I can't really speculate on that end um, and, you know, what, what's the ramifications, but it's rare. I don't ever expect to see another wolf in Calhoun County. 
Um, as you know, we've talked before about wolves' ability to move long distances, and you know that that's well documented. You know, more recently, we just had that wolf collared in over by Lake Ogebic, make it over in the Mon- uh, Manitoba, Canada, and travel wow. over four thousand miles. Um, so. Obviously, if it did come from Michigan, it made it across the straits at some point and got itself down there. So really interesting. I wonder how long it was there. Well, so many questions about this. The first thing I thought of, Brian, was, oh, this has got to be one of those cases where somebody was illegally raising a wolf. It got too big, got out of hand. They just said, to heck with it, I'm going to let it go. I just can't see a wolf. I'm no biologist, but I can't see a wolf coming down from the UP all the way to the southern tier of counties in the lower peninsula. It, yeah, it does seem very remote. Um, I'm, I'm going to shy away from speculating on its origin right yep. now, but uh, it is very suspect. Um, I agree. Uh, we did test to see if it did have any dog um, integration in it, and it does not. Hmm. So it is not a wolf-dog hybrid. You used the term a minute ago, Great Lakes wolf. Tell me more about that. I hear about eastern wolf, gray wolf. Uh, what's a Great Lakes wolf? Uh, well, a, great, a Great Lakes wolf is a gray wolf. Okay. Um, you know, it is Canis lupus. Um, however, they do have some integration of uh, eastern wolf in them. And so, and but we see we see DNA from the western gray wolf and the eastern wolf mixed into what we kind of call a great uh, Great Lakes wolf. It's not a separate species. It's not a subspecies. It is a gray wolf. Um, and this animal did test con, um, as a Great Lakes wolf. So I can tell you, it did. Its origin was the Great Lakes. It was not a western state. Gotcha. And this was taken by a coyote hunter. He was hunting with a guide and then self-reported. Or what's the uh, what are the logistics there? Um, it look, from my understanding, he was hunting with a guide. Um, they took this and then reported it as a world record coyote. And then this is just my understanding from social media. So I want to make <laughs> so it very take clear that, for that what I it's worth. not. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so then when I saw it, I talked with the biologist down there. He brought it to my attention in late January. So I'm not even sure on the harvest date yet. It just... Um, but when I saw the pictures of it from social media, I was like, okay, wait a minute. That is not a world record coyote. That is a wolf. Yeah. And so that's when we, we investigated further. All right. I appreciate that. Obviously, there's a lot of questions out there. I know you've got a lot of people you want to talk with yet, so I'm going to get out of your hair. But I will, uh, Brian, I'm going to stay in touch with you on this one, and uh, I'm real curious how this ends up. All right? Yeah, yeah. And as it plays out, um, yeah, I can certainly give you a shout back and let you know as, as I learn more. Yeah, please do that. I would appreciate that. Brian Roll, uh, wildlife biologist for the DNR. In fact, he's the head wolf guy, uh, michigan.gov slash DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR. I am going to make a prediction. I am not a biologist. I am not a DNR employee. I'm not a wildlife expert. I'm going to say that they're going to find out that this was a wolf that somebody had in captivity and they let it go. It got to be too much. I saw a similar thing happen down in Ohio when I was hunting down there uh, a couple of falls ago. Um, I do not believe that a wolf traveled from Michigan's Upper Peninsula all the way down to Calhoun County. I don't believe it. I obviously believe this is a wolf. The DNR just confirmed the the genetics. The DNA confirms it's a wolf. I don't believe it got down there on its own. You hear stories all the time about, oh, we have, I hear this all the time. All the time I hear this. Oh, we got a pack of wolves behind our house in name a county. Pick a county, Kent County. No, you don't. If you had a pack of wolves behind your house, you would know it because there would be no chickens around. There would be no pets around. Your cattle would be getting uh, attacked. If you had wolves, you would know they're wolves. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. But I am curious to see how this all ends up. Um, the official word on it, of course, Brian can't, can't say too much at this point, but you could hear it maybe in his voice. All right, we'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, we'll wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner. And I'm not even going to ask him for a wolf recipe. That would just be in bad taste. Get it? Bad taste? <laughs> I crack myself up. Uh, Charlie, I didn't get to tell you that there's a handful of people out there. And you know what they're saying, right? Charlie, Charlie. 
Dixie Dave coming up after the break right here in Outdoor Magazine. My name's Mike Avery. The website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery. If you are a new listener, welcome and thank you. If you are a long-time listener, thank you as well. And if you have heard the show before, you know that we wrap up each week's show with wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner. Uh, Dave, a long, long-time friend of mine. Um, we work together on so many different projects, so many different fundraisers. We work together in the TV show, now on the radio show. Uh, most recently, I saw him in the kitchen again at the Lumberjack Restaurant up in West Branch for our Wednesday Night Live a few weeks ago. And I'll tell you what, the guy had a big smile on his face. He was working hard, but he had a big smile on his face. Uh, David, welcome back. How are you? I'm fine and dandy. It was a great time up there. Yeah, really appreciated that. Ah, they're still low. They are such good people there at the Lumberjack, aren't they? Yep, yep. The kitchen staff was just amazing. They helped me out so much. Well, and I know they were honored to have you there. Um, what shall we do for a recipe this week? Well, we have uh, coconut walleye. We did this for the TV show. I can't even tell you how many years ago. And it's on page 12 of the cookbook. Okay. And this would be for four portions. So you need about eight ounces of boneless, skinless filet per person, one and a half cups of shredded coconut, oh, about a half a cup of uh, chopped pecans, a jar of chicken gravy, a couple ounces of either coconut liqueur or tropical schnapps, or if you like, you, you can buy them in airline uh, bottles of little one ounces, a couple of tablespoons of parsley, a couple of beaten up eggs a dash of white pepper, a couple ounces of heavy cream, and garlic butter. You can see that recipe on page two, or you can just add a little bit of chopped garlic to your flavoring. So, Now, the method we're going to use is you're going to dredge the fish in flour, then in beaten up eggs, and then you're going to roll it in coconut. You don't want to coat it too, too heavy, just like a medium. And in a medium hot pan, you're going to brown the fish on both sides. You want to do this one or two at a time. And then remove them to a, a plate or something so you can make the sauce. And then we're going to put this in a casserole on a baking dish. So coconut, you got to really be careful so it doesn't blacken. It can blacken very easy. And then when you got it nice and brown, put it in, like I said, put it on a plate. And wipe the pan out with a paper towel. Add the gravy, the schnapps, the coconut, liquor, pecans, heavy cream, half that parsley, a nice dash of white pepper couple of cloves of well maybe not two cloves of garlic but because this is kind of a sweeter dish maybe one one clove of garlic when you get it boiling and well blended put this in the bottom of a casserole and then lay the fish on top and if you want you can sprinkle a little bit of parsley and any more coconut on top make it about 350 degrees for 10 minutes because it's going to be halfway cooked already because when you're browning it it's going to start to cook it and 20 minutes in the oven might be too much. 10, mi 10 minutes ought to be just about right. And I would serve this with fluffy white rice and maybe asparagus spears mm. or fiddlehead mm. burns if you're going to do oh, it a little Oh, fiddleheads, later. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but you, you said, you know, worry about burning the coconut. But you do want to brown the coconut, right? That's part of the appeal yep, of the dish. Yep, 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 just brown it. Set the, it's going to set the coconut on the fish when you brown it a little bit on both sides. You got to really watch it because coconut will uh, scorch real, real quick. So it's one of them dishes you got to be right on it. Mm -hmm. Hey, as a side note, I heard from a guy the other day. He sent me a picture, and is is it is a picture of the very first edition of the Dixie Dave Cookbook. I have one. Do you? Yeah. Well, th then then you don't need this one. Then I'm going to keep it. Good idea. <laughs> I was well, gonna. Well, I was gonna offer it to, to you. <laughs> I have one of each saved. That's all. So, how many did you do? 
four. This four. is the, the one that we're working out of now is the fourth cookbook. And, and that's the, the compilation. Is, that's the big one. Yeah. You, wasn't your brother-in-law that printed them in the beginning? It was a, it was a, yeah, it was Cousin sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he printed that first one. Remember what a job that was organizing those all and getting those printed and distributed and oh, man. It was. The, the last one we did was great because I had uh, a lady, uh, Glenora there from Birch Run. She helped me uh, put it all together. And then we sent it out to get it printed down in uh, Saline, Michigan. Hmm. I think we sold about 10,000 copies. Oh, my total. gosh. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was picking them up 3,000 at a time. Wow. Wow. And they're still out there. I mean, the people who have them are hanging on to them. And like you said, you can still find them online on, I don't know, eBay or Facebook Marketplace or whatever's out there these days. But I would yep, encourage yep. people to pick one up. Check it out. Okay, dokie. All right, David, Thank we'll you. talk to you next week. I will post this recipe for Coconut Walleye, page 12 of the last edition of the cookbook. I will post this recipe on my Facebook page uh, so folks can take a look at it. All right, that's going to wrap up this week's show. Uh, man, it was an interesting show because it was constantly evolving. I didn't know if we were going to be able to get Chris Durson at the beginning of that second hour. Because of the storm going through the UP right now, we had to use his cell signal, and it worked out just great. And then we find out, or I find out, uh, three-quarters of the way through the show that the DNR had just put out a news release about this wolf taken by a hunter down in Calhoun County. I guess this was out floating around social media. I hadn't seen it before. But to get official confirmation that it is the DNA of a wolf. And I'll say it one more time. I suspect they're going to find out that this wolf did not migrate down from the Upper Peninsula. That's just me, and it's just speculation. My name is Mike Avery. The show is Outdoor Magazine. My website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine.